Okay, we're live right now with my brother Salam Gurmai. He's in Las Vegas right now, which a lot of folks misnomer as the city of sin. But I was originally brought into uh, ordination of the diaconate from a bishop who's in Las Vegas. And Salam himself has been on quite a spiritual journey over the past few years since he's moved from Los Angeles to Vegas. So I wanted to bring him on today so that he could chop it up with us about our communion. Um, let's let's start in a, in a simple place. Salam grew up in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, and uh, um, in a household that is Ethiopian and Eritrean, but he has a very firm identity with Ethiopia. And since he's been in Vegas, he's had an opportunity to visit both Armenian parishes and uh, Egyptian or Coptic parishes. Uh, of course, in addition to the Ethiopian, the various Ethiopian and Eritrean ones. So let's start off back with Ethiopia. Then we'll come to America and and uh, in LA and then go to to Vegas. Salam, what, what was your relationship in in growing up in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Ethiopia? And wh you know, what did you think of the faith growing up? Like, honestly, like, growing up, it was, uh, like, one of those things where you just go to church with your family, with your grandma, and I, and not. when we went to church, it was, we know it's the house of God. You get that respect, like, especially when you see it from them. Like, uh, a lot of my friends out here, they say, oh, I grew up Catholic, or I grew up Protestant, I grew up this, I grew up that. But they are not seeing what their religion is about, like, versus with us, when you go to church, uh, like, like, uh, like when you go for the whole Kadashi and when you take communion and when all of those things are happening, you, you start seeing a trend like and back home, especially in a lot of our uh, parishes, we have a holy water uh, place. And when you go over there, like when Tamara uh, Maram being read, when uh, holy water, a lot of people, you see people getting healed from stuff like HIV, cancer, from uh, like blindness, from so many things, you recognize it's the house of God and you get that a certain amount of respect for it. And when you see that respect going from families, from generations, like go to, on any holiday, you see the young people and the old people both celebrate. There is no age gap as in other churches, where it's by groups and stuff. So like that honestly sets you on a firm base of what your religion is supposed to be. That's good. And and what ages were you in Addis Ababa? From until when you were born 16. to when? Uh, until 16. Until 16. So then you came to LA to Los Angeles or Los Angeles. And what, what was it like? You know, what was different and what was the same from, you know, the faith that you grew up in uh, Ethiopia and then what, what you found in, in Los Angeles? Actually, uh, before 16, I lived in Texas for a year. And now I'm oh, back. I didn't know. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I lived in Dallas. Shout out to D Town. Eh, ish. <laughs> too many rednecks, bro. <laughs> so, so did you go to to church that year when you were in Dallas, or or did you not? No, I know there's Mikhail and a bunch of other parishes in in our communion. No, I actually went like a couple of times to Madani Adam, the Eritrean church over there, mm -hmm. but uh, I never really went to church. Like okay, that. but I know for sure consistently when you were in LA because that's how you and I ended up meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what was it like, man? What was different and what was the same from the way Ethiopians were worshiping in Addis Ababa versus how they're worshiping in, in L.A.? One, one major thing that I noticed um, across the board, not just in our churches, but across the board here in America, the churches are viewed less than a, less as a house of God and more as a property or more as, well, I mean, they still look at it as a church of God, but they're looking at it as, yeah, this is mine, that's yours. There is a t tend of uh, ownership that uh, you see. Versus when we went to Ethiopia, we, we used to go to all the churches to worship in Kanatuna Batu Chachino, Bita Christiano, it was a uh, house of God. It mm -hmm. wasn't my church, your church. When I came out here, that was the one thing I learned. It's like, you still have the reverence yeah. as the house of God, but then yeah. it's like, yeah, these guys' church is this, and that guy's church is that. That's very, very keen understanding that you have there. For those of you that don't understand, I might have to dig up this article. But I don't know if you know Father Alexander Schmemann, a longtime teacher, and he probably held some administrative positions at St. Vladimir's Seminary. He's 
of the Russian Orthodox Church, and he was at the most prestigious Orthodox seminary in the United States. He wrote this article a number of years ago exactly describing what you're talking about in the Greek and in the Russian Orthodox churches. And so the churches, how they existed in Greece and Russia versus how they existed in the United States. And one of the fascinating things is, you know, the dominant culture of the United States are called WASP, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It's those Puritans and the children of the Puritans that, that mainly establish United States. Of course, there are a bunch of other groups that eventually assimilate and integrate, but they set up all the various church structures. So when the Orthodox came here, when they were trying to establish their own churches, but um, you know, they were they were very innocent and meek and didn't have a lot of understanding, but they did the best they could. You know, some of them would play the liturgy from their phone and just gather around that. Some of them, you know, sometimes Vegas, LA, and San Diego would be served by Abbalaika at our parish. You know, he would be going back and forth like in the same weekend between San Diego, LA, and Vegas because of how few clergy there were. So the the understanding, the knowledge was not all there, but we we are, have to be kind of grateful that they established these churches in the first place. But they basically pressed uh, control C and copy and pasted the Protestant structure where there is a parish council or what's known as a board, you know, which is different than the Seva Kagwe, right? Uh, or the, the preaching conference, which is ruled by hierarchy. Hierarchy literally means ruled by priests. And so the whole ground up, foundation of the orthodox churches and the greek communion which includes the slavs or the russians and then our, our communion right the afro-asiatic communion which has our beloved is right is that they they copy and pasted the protestant way of forming a church where the people were in charge where it was a democracy which i call the the god of Burban or barabbas and then in ethiopia in greece in russia the way that it happened is you had the balasiltanat, you had the royalty, the aristocrats who would grant land from the land that they have, and they would just give it to the priests. So it was never one priest in charge. There's a Kesa Gabas, who's the priest who, who runs the day-to-day -day matters. There are the bishops who kind of manage on, on a big level, but really we gave it to, to the priests to, to run everything as opposed to here and maybe maybe you'll have to give some of the priests some entrepreneurial advice so that they could reestablish and anyway since this since the holy synod reconciled i know that people are taking steps to bring more alawadi or more of a organic or orthodox um, structure so so that was kind of your view of the ethiopian communities what about since you've been to, to Vegas, I've seen you post some stuff and I know you and I have talked back and forth about certain hymns that you taught them in English. What's been your experience like visiting Coptic churches and Armenian churches? It's actually uh, uh, pretty awesome. Right? That's all I can say. Like uh, all of our churches, like for example, the other day, like falls out of my house, I'll just show you right now. Uh, I borrowed an Armenian Kandashi book from a, uh, from the, priest and i was reading in, in english they have it in english yeah it's, it's actually like they have an old armenian language so there's old armenian uh how to read it in english uh like how the upside how would be h a yeah. like that and then there's english and then there's the modern armenian so it's like four languages the tr they call it a transliteration yeah okay yeah so that's basically the transliteration and then the english too so mm -hmm. basically like for a minute now i've been going to their church because uh uh, it does, yeah. it didn't stop even uh, during disease management. Like they made sure it, what while well, government request was fulfilled oh. without kicking the people out. Mm -hmm. That's so, a good uh, pastoral move. Do they start the same time? No, they start at eleven. So that's a lot better. <laughs> very time issue. I tell you about. I knew. I knew they started later. You said eleven. Eleven a.m. Yeah. Wow. And what time do the local Ethiopian churches like Kidana Mirat start? Or oh, Mikhail and Gabriel. Like six and Gabriel starts at seven. So six and seven a.m. versus eleven a.m. So you get to sleep in a little more. <laughs> oh, definitely. You sleep what, a little more, and then like you don't miss nothing. Yeah. What, what What else is different? You know, we're in the same communion, right? So um, that means whatever. I know. Oftentimes, rather than the word Orthodox, which they're not offended by, they usually self-describe themselves as the Apostolic Armenian. I've I've heard our Armenian friends say that several times. So there should be something that's orthodox, but also something that's apostolic that the Armenians, the Copts, the Ethiopians, the Eritreans, and the Malankra or the Indians share. But also there are some differences. What what do you see as some of the differences? Culture-wise. 
like culture wise, there's so many, it's so different. That's why I prefer our churches uh, at any point. If there's a chance to go to our church versus that, I would go to ours. Uh, but then, like uh, with us, like you see churches literally shutting shutting people out after 50 people because the state is saying 50 people. Yeah. Stuff like that. Dur- during the COVID 19 crisis, and you still want to go to church. That makes sense. What, um, so, what's, what's the actual liturgy like? You know, do they have instruments? Do they not have instruments? Do they do they sing a lot? You know, what is it like? Do people wear shoes or no? Yeah, they wear their shoes. And actually, part of their losa uh, tekenu is uh, slippers for their priests. Oh, that's like the Syrians. Yeah. yeah. I believe they call them the gospel of peace shoes. I'm not sure what they call them, but I, I know the shoes. Are, come on, man. But I know that's their tradition. Uh, what about the laity? Like, how do the the faithful, the meminan, how how do the meminan dress? Like, what is considered Sunday's best or like Sunday clothing? They have this thing I read once. It says a uh, church uh, behavior supposedly was uh, like to dress in uh, suits, uh, to dress officially. But half the people don't. They just come in jeans and stuff. And uh, like, it pisses me off when I see some of the women. Uh, they don't even cover their hair, which is religiously required. So when they go up to take Holy Communion, there's a like, a, like a scarf thing that they put right there. They'll just pick that up, put it on, go take Holy Communion, take it off, and go back. To okay, per, you mean like provided by the the parish itself? Yeah, but in, in actuality, when I was talking to somebody, they said in their country they actually put it on. Uh, they they used to put it on. Over here, they just don't want to or something. They're becoming too uh, modernized. Yeah, so it's like a thing it. where. There's a study Malcolm Gladwell, one of the writers at The New Yorker, had, and he used to say that, I, I'm going to give you the short version to not give you the long version, but the short version is just that people have different thresholds for when they're going to do something that they think is the right thing. So let's say that they believe you know, women having head coverings, which is pretty common, um, but not universal amongst the Orthodox. Let's say that they believe that's the right thing to do. Not everyone is ready to do the right thing by themselves. Some people, you know, like Dusatanatios, uh, right, Saint Athanasius the Great, they're they're ready to to do something all by themselves if they believe it's the right thing. Other people, they need at least two of their boys or two of their friends. Some people need ten people, and some people are only going to follow the crowd. They're only going to you know do the right thing because of everyone else. Like you know, an example I give, and I think would be an interesting question for you is in the Ethiopian you, community. Can you hear me? Samalo? Can you hear me, Salah? Yo, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, you cut off for a second. Now you're back. Okay. So an example I want to give you, and it's also a question, is the Ethiopian community knows that it's the right thing to do to take communion, to receive the flesh and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet a lot of people choose not to do that thing. And part of the reason I think is because people don't want to stick out. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's what's going on in the head covering example you're giving. That's kind of a negative example. So let's try to do a positive one, which I'm going to guess at. What, what, how many people would you say take communion in the Armenian community that you've been a part of versus the, the Ethiopian one? Actually, a lot, a lot more. Uh, and communion is kind of across the board. I mean, you you see them not taking communion this week, but then you'll see them taking communion next week. And then the week after that, you won't see them. Uh, it's just that. And also, one thing is they have this group confession that they read. If you ever go to an Armenian church, right before uh, communion is administered, you'll see the deacon come out and, and uh, get, get on his knees in front of the uh, priest. And then read a confession. Whoever wants to is uh, allowed to participate in that. Oh, do you move to the front, or you just stay where you are in the in the audience? You could do either. I, when I do it, I would go to the front. To the front, but uh, like you could stay where you are. But then, like it's uh, that confession is it, it basically adds every single possible sin put of them into the list. And so, and this litany of confessional sins. Is it is it just like one you know kind of regular part of the liturgy, and then people go in private as well, or I, I don't know how well you know this community, or do people still go one on one, or no? Yeah. Their their liturgy book says, yeah. uh, I've never done it, but their liturgy book says, yeah. but uh, it's actually from what I've heard from a lot of them, it's uh, 
there is this Armenian genocide that happened in Syria, in Syria and Turkey, like uh, basically uh, about a hundred something years. Mm -hmm. So since then, their their uh, clergy has declined by power by millions. So they don't have as, as many priests in order to uh, administer stuff like confession. <laughs> you just get a text, bro. Yo, <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, my thing keeps cutting out. I don't know why. I see you and hear you. Go ahead. You said the yeah. Armenian genocide led to them having like millions of less clergy, which makes it harder to hear confession. Yeah. It makes sense. The so, Greeks, uh, the Assyrians, yeah. and I think even some like Druids and stuff got massacred by, by the Ottomans, like you said, about 100 years ago. Yeah. So what they did after that is if they can't hear every single uh, person's uh, confession, they they abbreviated something called the confessions by uh, Saint, Saint Ephraim the Syrian. So that's like, oh, yeah, I've sinned in all possible forms. It even ah, says one thing that, that always shocks me when I read it. It says I've uh, I've committed by against the laws of God, uh, both prohibitive and both permissive. So it says, uh, for I have neither performed that which is uh, or ordered, that which I'm I'm to do, like fasting stuff like that. We, we, without doing that, that's a sin. But then it says I've also not abstained from uh, those sins which are prohibited. So the saying, I have seen it send in every single form possible. Lord have mercy on me. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, like, it always gets me when I read that because it's say Like, I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, because we consider it a sin when we steal. We consider it a sin when we cut somebody out. We might consider it a sin when, uh, like, you're going with a female, like, when you're doing sins. You know those are sins. But then there are sins you don't realize because, yeah, when you're told to pray, when you're told to fast, when you're told to give water to a hungry person, to like give food to a hungry person, water to the thirsty. If you see a homeless person naked and you got an extra shirt in your car, man, toss it at him. You know, when we don't do those, we feel like, hey, yeah, man, we just doing us. But when God judges us, he, one of the things he talks about is, man, you didn't do this. You don't do it for the person that's next to you. How are you even going to do it for me if you saw me? You don't know me. And now when I, whenever I read those, like, I was like, oh, shit. And I, it reminds me every time, like, man, go out and do your best, like, you see a lady that's in Russia and you're, you want to get to church, it's going to add 10 seconds into your drive, man. Just let her go, man. Like, you see her in a rush, like, itching. Like, yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go right after you. Not a problem. You do stuff like that, then, you know, like, the Lord will count it. Amen. Uh, that that used to be the, the title of my, my old Christian blog. I titled it, God first, your neighbor second, and you last. So it sounds like you're saying, if we prioritize others before us, even when we think we're doing something that looks holy, you know, we might try to get to church, which is a holy thing, and cut some lady off or risk her life, which is a very unholy thing. So the better thing is to kind of put the human being made in her image and uh, made in his image and his likeness first, prioritize them before our, our own even like appearingly spiritual need. That, that's beautiful. Another thing I have heard is that there, there may be some differences in, in the calendar, particularly out of our communion with the with the Armenians, and I know that you're someone from back in the day when I used to know you. You know the calendar of the the Guz right very well. You know the Guz calendar very well. I know you know the monthly holidays, which I'm very bad at knowing, and then like the the biannual holidays too of of all the various saints. So I know Saint Peter's and Paul, I believe, is coming up in about a week or so in the good is right tradition but if i'm not mistaken i think the armenians celebrate a little early like on the western calendar so how, how has that been for you like someone who knows our, our good is calendar very well like monthly michael and gabriel and, and and other holidays of saints and everything i mean i keep our calendar but i mean like i said i've only been going there uh, probably a couple of months at the most but uh like i know they celebrated easter on the on this calendar on the american calendar and mm -hmm. uh Indians do that too, because one one time I went to their church and saw uh, they don't have a church per se, but they use a Protestant church to perform liturgy and stuff. So uh, I went there and checked it out one day. But uh, calendar wise, it's not a big deal. It's, okay. Keep which whichever one you can is all I can say because, like, when I go there, like when it when it was their Pentecost, yeah, I celebrated Pentecost with them. But then I, a week later, I celebrated ours. It's like. There's this thing that uh, you ever heard of Augustine, Ambrose, and stuff like that? They're like some Roman saints. Mm -hmm. uh, they're Roman saints from when we were in communion. So they're 
consider correct, it an art. Correct. They're yeah. pre pre Chalcedonian saints of the church. The yeah. the Western Church, Augustine's one of the doctors, and Ambrose is the guy who, when Augustine was a pagan and a Manichaean, convinced him through his non literal preaching of Genesis to convert to Christianity. Augustine used to think that that the Old Testament was stupid and only stupid people could believe in it. And he heard Ambrose of Milan one day and he converted because of that. I heard a scholar on Twitter the other day actually say one of the interesting things about Augustine is that none of his writings showed up in Syriac until like way, way, like almost a thousand years later. So the Westerners place a very high value on him. Even some Calvinists try to claim him as a sort of pseudo pre-Calvinist. Um, and I think there are a lot of great things we could learn from him. But yeah, we and he he is a pre-Chalcedonian saint, so we accept him. But uh, it's it's a different level. We, he's not on the same level as Caduceus or Saint Jared of Oxum for us. But but yeah, what were you gonna say about Ambrose and Augustine? Yeah, I mean, see uh, the uh, one thing that uh, I think Augustine asked Ambrose. He said, uh, "When when I'm in Milan and stuff, like they they don't fast on Saturday, but uh, when I'm in Rome, they fast." So he said, "What am I supposed to do?" And the uh, response he got was, "When in Rome, was the Romans do?" So like yeah. When I'm, yeah, when I'm at Armenian church, I'll do exactly what they do and celebrate with them. But when I'm with us, I'll do ours. Like Coptics uh, celebrate the same holidays we do every single time. Like some, like Kuskwam, for example, like on Tirarsitis, that would would uh, only mean under the Coptic church, it only means uh, a church was built on Mount Kuskwam. But uh, under our church, it means maybe Tachina, she went back to... Uh, it's a holiday of Mary. It's one of the 33 holidays of Mary. Exactly. So... That's like yeah. a little bit of difference right there. But for the most part, with Coptics, we're the same with Syrians and stuff. We're mm -hmm. not the It would be very interesting them. to see the Ethiopian church in the year of Kudusiarid in the 500s, um, to see the Ethiopian church in the time even before that with the nine saints, and then to see the church in like the year 1000, and yeah. then the church again in the year like 1200. Because a lot of those kind of um, monthly holiday reforms, you know, are they're hugely attributable to Emperor Zedaiko. So um, it may have been that we were more like the Coptic Church, and then just you know, as more time passes, our the Ethiopians we we add to our own tradition more. Like there's a sense in which we we didn't invent some things, but we got some things from Coptic and Syriac and Greek and Hebrew. And we kept them like nobody has the book of Enoch. Nobody has Kufale or the book of Jubilees. So somehow we kept those things. We preserved them, even if we didn't originally author them. And then on top of that, you know, we have the first part of the liturgy, which we had the, from the from the Alexandrian, right? The Copts. But then we have 14 of our own anaphoras. When you go to the Greeks and when you go to the Copts, you see like two, maybe three different anaphoras or liturgies in effect. And we have 14. Asis uh, Mabratu claims that we have actually 20, that there are six that are only in the monasteries that even most of us don't even know. I've never even seen a translation of or or seen what the names of, of those extra six liturgies would be. But that's a really good mentality. And um, that's a common American idiom, by the way, the when in Rome thing. I'm glad you gave us the complete picture because I bet you a bunch of people know how to say when in Rome. And then maybe some people will know when in Rome do as the Romans. But that context of which you are respectful to the feasting and to the fasting traditions of the various rites, especially, you know, in the early times, more diverse, less homogenized, more heterogeneous. And even now, um, you know, we have a, a, a pretty like diverse communion. That, that you've been able to to get a part of. So are there any other insights you'd say that you've had in visiting? I, I didn't know you visited Indian church too. So like the Malankara or the, the Indians, as well as the Armenians, Ethiopians. I don't know if you visited any Syrians before, but any other insights about that? And then um, we can plug that that new Facebook page that, that you said you've been running. Oh, I, I just started that page uh, like literally four days ago. Uh, so... Is pretty brand new, but uh, yeah, because one thing you'll notice across the board is our religion is the same. Like, if you look at the, even the Kadasi, like uh, Ahadus and all of them, uh, like uh, Tansu, no, that's the like, father, like arise, mm -hmm. like, arise for prayer, yeah, yeah, like that's actually all and all of them. Like, even like uh, earlier, I was reading this thing, uh, 
It says doxology in the Armenian Kandasi. Uh, it says, blessed is the Father, true God. Blessed is the Son, true God. Blessed is the Holy Spirit, true God. Praise and glory be to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Like, with us, we say it as, Baruch is that, I was like, Lord, I'm not going to, Lord, Baruch, Lord, it's not Jesus, but so it's my God. No, no, yeah, we say it like that. So, uh, we have Was it the in the same part? Word. Was it in the same part of the liturgy? Because sometimes we'll okay. have, like, the same words, but they'll be in a different part of the liturgy. I've noticed that, too. Yeah, that, that's what it, it was. Different part. Like, different this part. one was, like, Literally right before communion, almost. Uh, so yeah. there's this little fraction. It was like right before that. And in ours, it's in the beginning of the liturgy. Exactly. Uh, I was thinking of, for example, Bantek Adesat, which is, you know, the litany. And the deacon usually reads it in our church. But I think it's the priest in the Coptic church who, who reads that one, where you, you pray for the sake of those traveling by air and by land and sea. And they added air recently, which I like. Yeah. Okay, so were there, were there any other things that you wanted to say about uh, traveling between the, the various churches? I, I like how you stress the unity. Yeah, like, trust me, like, we're the same, you know, like, because, uh, for example, like, uh, one of the monks that, like, if, if, have you ever been to the mon monastery here in California? Yep, yep, St. Anthony's in yeah. uh, Newberry Springs, just outside of uh, Barstow, which is halfway between Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Exactly. Uh, when I went there once, uh, they were talking about a, a monk they called Abuna, yeah, Abuna, yeah, Abuna Abdul Masi Al, -Al Habashi is what they call them. Uh, like Abdul Masi means Abba the Breakfast is not that much. And wow. uh, he was who back in the day, like not even back in the day, like the ninth, twentieth century, went from Ethiopia to Egypt and was serving. Them. You know, uh, as long as we have the same religion, we can go to all of them. I mean. Uh, like one thing I can say is, uh, since all Orthodox, like especially our Orthodox, we're the same, we, we can go, like we have differences. Like for example, don't go there and you see them eat pork, don't eat pork, of course, like, because that's our tradition. You're not supposed to do it. But like, uh, it's not really a big difference. Like if you see them wearing shoes, because it's our religion, I'll take off my shoes and I'll go in. Uh, when, when I see them like not wearing a net at all, because it's our religion and I'm representing me. And my my religion, I'll go in there as us. You don't. So have you to wear you stuff. wear the Ethiopian clothing. You wear the white garb, the net Allah, when you go to their churches. Yeah, yeah like uh, you have to represent you wherever you go. And when, whenever they come to us, they represent them. So I mean, even uh, even though, like, say for example, like I've I've invited a couple of people over to our churches, especially to like Demara and stuff. I tell them, hey guys, you know, you guys should come. Blah blah blah. And whenever they come to us, uh, what I tell them is just look. Like, Put something on your head. It, women are supposed to cover their hair. It's part of the Bible. It's part of the religion. You have to do it. I don't tell them nothing else. And then they, when they come, they actually put like a scarf on or something. Uh, and I've seen them uh, pop by too. So like that's why I know. Like they're like, hey, thanks for telling me. I would have been sticking on like a sore thumb. Yeah, that that's good advice. It's um, and I'm I'm more important than everything from what I hear you saying is like. You're beginning these conversations with people. And like I mentioned earlier, you've taught some of them some of the hymns or spiritual songs from our tradition that um, you know I helped a little bit. And, and you figured out some of your own in terms of translating into English as, as well. And I know you weren't always the biggest fan of English hymns, so I was definitely glad to be vindicated in that way. Um, that's, that's really good, man. Um, in closing, uh, what, why don't you go ahead and, and, uh, and plug your, your, your new page, and, and that'll be good for us. All right, hold up real quick. Before that, actually, one thing I was always against, it's not the use of English. Since way back when, when I always tried to stop you, it's how you did it. <laughs> how, you, how you went about it is you tried to tell people, uh, yeah, man, just learn the English one instead of ours. But what I wanted always is they could learn English translation. English translation is not a problem. It's a language. I mean, uh, the apostles were given the language of all the world for them to preach to the people that were there. But the thing is, as an Ethiopian Orthodox Church, we have to teach, especially our Ethiopian, our Ethiopian uh, people that are growing up out here. They don't have an identity. Like a lot of people bring them to church just to bring them. I mean, uh, can you count how many people bring them there right before communion? Let them take communion. Let them run outside and nothing else. They don't have Elf, learn. Elf, Elf, exactly. Elf. That's and that's 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 the uh, little, 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 little
ምስክር አይደለሁም ስለ ግዕዝና ስለ አማርኛ ስታስቡ እንደው እውነት ነት አማን በአማን በ እሺ ቬሪ ትሩሊ ቬሪ ኢንግሊሽ አይ ሳይ 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 I have a specific reverence for the church because uh how I saw it in my family how I saw it in my community versus young people out here are not seeing that they they just go to church they see oh yeah my mom's church maybe they'll get married there maybe they'll uh, like uh, have fit hot there when they die but they don't really know the church they don't really know what they're a part of so they'll miss it and then they'll go into a whole new religion or they'll go into some uh they won't teach their kids so basically in two three generations that will be gone so that's actually one of the main things i was against english like uh but you know, as a means of teaching as a means of uh, translation as long as we keep our thing like uh it's not a problem actually by the way i was doing it uh, for this one coptic guy uh, i was uh it was a kind of remix but uh aman ba man takra manu tsay milo mazmo takyalch yeah So like I translated that as uh Aman Ba Man Abu Namu Sheikh Ayyub because it was Musa Ali the other day and now he's like how how does it go in Moses, English Moses Moses the Black I English yeah. I I say the word in English one for him to understand Yeah as a piece of teaching is not a problem but we have to be careful on how we did it How how did it go you know it was just the Moses the Black or Moses the Strong Moses the Darker Ethiopian holiday why don't you give us a a taste of of that mazmur <laughs> you can do it in English and in Gaz All right, I got you. Uh, all right, so uh, like, you know how it goes, like, Aman, 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 Truly, verily, Truly, verily, uh-huh. ዝማሪ መላእክ ያሰማል ማይ ጋድ ሃቭ ዩ ሂር ዘ ዘ ሜሎዲስ ኦፍ ዘ ኤንጀል Thank you so much for the beautiful mesmer weather. 